Hello, everyone. My name is Lyudmila Pogorelova. As the director of the Shevchenko Museum, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to this evening's Shevchenko Museum talk. This presentation is sponsored by Odzic Foundation. Today, March 9, on the 207th anniversary of Taras Shevchenko's birth, and one day after International Women's Day, we are pleased to have you join us for a talk on women in the works of Taras Shevchenko, presented by Dr. Maxim Tarnavsky, professor in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Toronto, where he teaches a course on Taras Shevchenko. A specialist in the study of Ukrainian realist prose, Professor Tarnavsky has published major works on Valerian Pidmohelny and Ivan Nechuilevetsky. His extensive scholarly publications include articles in academic journals, book chapters, encyclopedia entries, translations, and reviews. His book, Between Reason and Irrationality, The Prose of Valerian Pidmohelny, was awarded Best Book in Ukrainian Studies by the American Association of Ukrainian Studies in 1995, and was awarded Best Book in Ukrainian Studies by the Ukrainian Free University Foundation in 2005. Professor Tarnavsky is editor of the journal Ukrainian Literature, a journal of translation published by the Shevchenko Scientific Society and the creator of the Electronic Library of Ukrainian Literature, which can be found on the web page of the Department of Slavic Studies of the University of Toronto. In addition to having presented numerous papers at meetings and symposia over the years, Professor Ternavsky is currently preparing for publication a monograph on the prose of Ivan Franco and an entry on Ivan Nechuilevitsky for a collectively authored project called History of Ukrainian Literature. Today, we are fortunate to have the opportunity to hear him speak on the theme of women in the works of Taras Shevchenko. It is an honor and great pleasure to introduce Professor Tarnavsky. By the way, if you have questions for Professor Tarnavsky, there will be Q&A after the talk. Thank you, Lyudmila for that introduction. And thank you in particular for the invitation to speak. I, I know I have turned down <laughs> opportunities to do Shevchenko commemorative events in the past. I'm happy to do it this year. On a personal note, I would just like to dedicate this presentation to my mother. My mother was herself a poet and a great lover of Shevchenko. And she passed away this September. It's an honor to talk about Shuchenko, but I need to insist that I'm not really a specialist on Shuchenko. I'm a lover of Shuchenko. For me, Shuchenko is a poet, a poet I love to read, a poet I love to talk about, mostly to talk about his works. The best thing about Shuchenko is his poetry, and the best thing about talking about Shuchenko is to read his poetry and to have others listen to reading his poetry. And so today's talk is not going to be a scholarly presentation of some fundamentally new thesis. I have no new thesis to present. I will be repeating ideas that others have covered, but I do want to concentrate a great deal on reading Shuchenko. And so I will read quite a few texts during my presentation. And in that regard, I need to say that there's a problem with Shuchenko, and particularly when you're speaking in English. That is, with no disrespect to the translators, Shuchenko is almost impossible to translate. And so 
I will be reading Shuchenko in Ukrainian because that's the only way to actually capture what's going on. I will, and I'll do that right now, share my slideshow, which will have the texts of the works I'm reading in English. I will be using the English translations of Peter Fedinsky. There is there are other translations of Shuchenko. Fedinsky's translations have some strengths and some weaknesses. I will say one of the great strengths for me in preparing this presentation was that they were available to me electronically. So I could put them in the slideshow. Women and Shuchenko is a well-trodden theme. That is, I'm certainly not the first, hopefully not the last, but I am in a long line of people who have spoken and written about Shuchenko and women. Presentations of this topic vary very, very, very widely, as does most work on Shuchenko, from uh, breathless enrapturement with the great Ukrainian poet, and therefore a search for all of his love interests, and the very often the point of such searches is to demonstrate that Shuchenko was a great lover of women, which no doubt he was, but that's not really the most serious interpretation of Shuchenko. There are some very serious uh, interpretations of this topic of Shuchenko and women, some biographical. That is, Shuchenko is a very uh, good topic for biographical research. A great deal of information has been amassed about him. And so various researchers have dug through various uh, archives and publications to discover what can be discovered about Shuchenko and women. I, I should mention one of, one of the earliest was a scholar in the 30s and 40s of the previous century, Maria Shahinyan, who you know, took quite seriously the assignment of discovering all the various hidden facts, it, at that time still mostly hidden, about Shuchenko and women. There are also theoretically interesting and very serious investigations of this topic. Some, I'll, I'll mention two, that is uh, the late Professor Lutsky right here at the University of Toronto uh, wrote about on the topic of Shuchenko and bastards. Well, the Shuchenko and bastards is effectively a topic about women as well. And it's a, a Jungian investigation of the topic, a very serious uh, look at what, how we could possibly understand what kinds of ideas are in Shuchenko's mind when he's talking about women. The, the other very serious presentation is in, in the works of George Grabovich, whose uh, one of his great accomplishments in Shuchenko studies is the uncovering of what he calls deep structures in the works of Shuchenko. And certainly, you know, the, the question of women's role in Shuchenko's uh, works is ripe for that kind of analysis. Since it's international or was International Women's Day yesterday, I should point out that Shuchenko and the values of International Women's Day are probably not uh, a good match, unfortunately, but so it is. Not only is Shuchenko a creature of the middle of the 19th century, but we will be looking at poetry and the kind of psychological structures he puts into his poetry. And he's a romantic poet, so he writes in a way that is 
old fashioned and more or less not familiar to us anymore. He is not a great champion of women's equality and, and the fight for uh, women's rights. I would sooner put him in the category, the, the Germans have the, the great expression of the three Ks, the Kinderküche Kirche, and the, that is children, kitchen, church. And Shevchenko's presentations of women tend in that direction, but let me say they tend in that direction when viewed on a surface level. Actually, Shevchenko's presentations of women usually tend in the direction of self-analysis. In our presentation today, I wanna to talk about poetry. I've already said that, that for me is very important. That in fact, it's the only thing about Shevchenko that I really am interested in. But that means I'm leaving out a whole lot of other things. That is, one can talk about Shevchenko and women in biography, in, in his paintings, in his prose, in his diary. I, I won't be talking about all those things. So I won't be talking. I, th there are you know, some of the great famous subjects of Shevchenko and women. I won't be talking about Princess Retnina. I will not be talking about the Polish girl in Vilnius or the brothel in Nizhny Novgorod or the wives of the camp commanders of the camps where he was stationed, the various models, nude and otherwise, that he painted, his sisters, his mother, his stepmother. I, I leave all that aside. I wanna talk about poetry. And I won't be talking about all the women in this poetry either. That is, there are quite a few. And I, I've picked out some, some of the women's images in his poetry that I find more interesting. I, I won't say that I have an airtight case that this is the necessarily the right way to understand women in his poetry, but I want to present a version of how Shochenko looks at women in, in particular ways. I think these are the most important women in his works, but there are plenty others. And I'll mention one outlier right away. Shochenko has a poem from 19, uh, I'm sorry, 1860, that he wrote on the day that Alexandra Fedorovna died. Alexandra Fedorovna, oh, AKA Princess Charlotte of Prussia, was the wife of Nicholas I, of this late Tsar. He was dead by this time. And uh, let, let me read a little bit. <laughs> to i poležet ne dajuć ledačumu, tebež o suko, i me sami, i naši vnuke, i merom ljude proklenuć, ne proklenuć, a tiko plunuć na teh odojenih šenja. That's not the usual way Shuchank talks about women. He doesn't call them bitches and make fun of them as, as mother of terrible people, but he hated this woman. He had written about her once before in his long poem entitled A Dream, where he describes flying through St. Petersburg and watching all the injustices that take place there and presents the Tsar and then his wife at his side, the poor Tsarina, like a dried out mushroom, skinny leggy, has a wobbly head. That, that poem is the one that got him in trouble. That is, when he got arrested and the Tsar actually personally got to see what Shushenko had written, this, this poem was an important part of the venom that the Tsar's family felt towards Shushenko that resulted in his punishment. He hated her. He hated her mostly as a symbol but her husband did him wrong. In turning to what I really wanna talk about today, I wanna to talk about 
three levels. That is, I'll start with some simple biographical women. That is, Shuchenko in his poetry mentions real living flesh and blood women other than the Tsaretsa. From, from there, and we will look at, at two kinds of those women. From there, we'll turn to the women that are inventions of his, that is the storylines that he creates around women's images. And this is the heart and soul of his understanding of the image of women. And, and in the end, I will say a few words, I hope to explain how I understand this and what I understand to be Shuchenko's the interpretation, his psychological presentation of women. But in talking about real women, I cannot but start with a woman who oh, could have almost been a family member of mine. She's Tarnowska, I'm Tarnowski, but close enough. Nadia Tarnowska, no, Nadia Tarnowska was the wife of one of the rich Ukrainian magnates. I'm sorry, she was not the wife. She was the sister of one of the rich Ukrainian magnates whose brother was one of the richest Ukrainian magnates. And these are people who Shoshenko met as an artist. Her uncle, Hrihori, was the owner of a huge estate called Kachanyuka. His brother was the owner of another estate called Potokye. Shuchenko visited them both and got to meet uh, Ms. Tarnowska. She was apparently a, quite a religious woman. She never married. And Shuchenko in his encounters with him, that is, he would visit these rich estates. Shuchenko in 1843 is a budding young painter who, and a poet, coming out into the world, making friends with some of the richest people in Ukraine who are welcoming him in their homes. He's painting portraits of them. He never painted this woman, the, the image you see is not a Shuchenko image. It is a image from much later in her life. She, she would have been much younger. She would have been 23 when Shuchenko met her. And she has the great distinction in uh, Shuchenko's poetry that he refers to her as his Kuma. The, uh, Kuma, of course, is someone who is also godparent to the same person you're godparent to. And in Ukrainian culture, kume are, well, they're, they're, they're close. They're almost relatives. That is, it, it's almost family, but it's family, not biologically, but socially. So they're, they're presumably close. Shuchenko mentions her in two poems. Let me point out from the very start some of the problems with translation. This poem begins with the words velikomuchenitse kumo durna yeseta nerozumna. Well, oh my friend just doesn't come close. And velikomuchenitse creates an atmosphere of religious undertones but with an ironic flavor. He goes on, Ate kumashu spala, spala, peshala sha, ta divuvala, ta ždala, ždala ženeka, ta cilomudrie hranila, ta strach bojala sha hricha prelubodino. Well, this is an invitation to sin, he makes it very clear at the end. Givuish molish shata spish, tamater bojuju gnivish, svim smirenien lukavim. 
прокинься, кумо, пробудиш та кругом себе подивиш, нехай на ту дівочу славу та щирим серцем нелукаво хоч раз сердего соблуди. I don't know if that's what we understand under International Women's Day. This, this isn't quite Harvey Weinstein, but it does sound a little bit like Andrew Cuomo or the former President Clinton. This, he, he's hitting on this woman and suggesting that they sin. It's not the Shochenko we usually think of, but he did that too. Clearly it didn't work. <laughs> he has a poem just a few days later. Kuma moja i ja v Petropatlovskim labirinti blukale. They're still hanging around in Petersburg, but she's not accepting his advances. That was one woman. Another woman I want to talk about from a similar aristocratic setting, whom Shochenko also met roughly at the same time, that is, as, as a painter traveling Ukraine, meeting rich people, painting portraits of them and their wives and their children. Hanna Zakrevska was the wife of Platon Zakrevsky. He, he's the brother of Viktor Zakrevsky, who was a retired military man. That's Platon in the color portrait. That's Viktor in, in the pen and ink. Viktor was a retired military man and part of that uh, company of Shochenko's friends who got to be called the Mochemorde, drinking buddies, right? The poem to Zakrevska, unlike the poem to Tarnovska, which was written in 1860, a year before Shochenko died, not a full year. These were written in 1848. It's always important to remember when Shochenko is writing because it explains a lot about what he's doing. This, this poem, is written on the expedition to Kosaral, to the Aral Sea. Shevchenko has been sent, he's conscripted into the military for writing poetry the Tsar didn't like, but he's in circumstances that are, he didn't like them, he didn't like this trip, but he is rather free to do what he pleases in this trip. And he's reflecting that here he is in the middle of nowhere and reflecting on the good old days before his arrest. Nemaye hirše jak nevoli pro bolju zhadovat, a ja pro tebe volim komo ja oce nahaduju. Nikoli ti ne zdavala še meni takoju harno molodoju i prehorošuju takoju jak tak Тепер на чужині, та ще й в неволі, доле, доле, моя ти співана я воле. Now that's addressed to freedom, but it's clearly also meant to reflect this woman. Танчуєте? А ти мій покою, моє свято чорнобриве, і дощі між ними тихо, пишно похожаєш, і тими очима аж чорними, голубими, і дощі чаруєш людські душі. Чи ще й дощі дивуються в сує на стан гнучий? Свято моє, єдине є свято, як оступлять тебе доли діточки, дівчата, і защебечуть по своєму 
доброму звичаю, може і мене ненароком діточки згадають, може яка і про мене скаже, яке лихо. Шевченко is remembering days when his life was simpler, before he was imprisoned. Well, he's not imprisoned, he's, he's conscripted by force, but he's not a free man anymore. And he associates the joys of that freedom with women, this woman in particular. Якби зустрілися ми знову, чи ти злякалася б чи ні, яке є тихе те слово, тоді промовила мені. Would you be scared of me? Would you recognize me? That is, Shuchenko is using these women as an image to present himself in a state of unfreedom, to present himself as a suffering individual. They are the joys of the past. These were both of these, Zakrevska and Tarnovska, aristocratic woman. I want to turn to some of the plain women that Shuchenko wrote about and knew because Shuchenko made a big difference between aristocratic and plain women. And in fact, in his personal life, he, when he was trying to get married, and we'll talk about that in a moment, he always chose non-aristocratic women. He actually talks about that. How could I possibly marry an aristocratic woman? His first, attempt at this, this is in 1857, he is returning, he has been freed finally, and he is traveling up the Volga back to Moscow and then Petersburg. And he meets a very young, very young indeed, actress in Nizhny Novgorod. She's all of 15, he's 43, and he tries to marry her. She is all over his diary. He writes about this in his diary, but he wrote no poems about her. And so I will read none. But then there was Likera Polusmak. Likera Polusmak, a woman he met when he returned in Petersburg. She is a former serf. That is, she is in the same class of individuals that he is. He's a former serf. She too was manumitted by her owner. She is working as a servant in the home of one person in particular, Zabila. Shochenko fell in love with her and showered her with presents. He painted a portrait, that is a portrait by Shochenko himself of Likera Polusmak. He wrote a couple poems to her. I want to read, well, two of them. Oh, I'm sorry. Moya te lubo mi te druže. I point this out again because the other one was Kumasha and she was translated as my friend. This one is not Kumasha at all. This is a woman he's trying to marry. How do you translate this? He describes in this poem an incident where he tried to go to town with her. That is, she was working on the estate of Miss Zabila, and he wanted to take her to Petersburg for a day 
to have a good time. And her mistress, not an owner, she's a free woman now, but her mistress says, no, you can't do that. That, that would be immoral. You can't do that without a chaperone. I'm not going to allow that. And Shushenko gets real upset. That is, what do you mean? You're going to keep me from my girlfriend? And complains in the poem. Freedom and a quiet home where we could spend our lives together. But Liketa turned him down eventually. Liketa, what we know about Liketa suggests that Shulchenko was uh, blind to her actual character. Liketa apparently was a young lady who liked to have a good time. She certainly liked the city. She wasn't going to take him up on his offer to go live in some Ukrainian village for the rest of her life. So she eventually turned him down and it was a big blow up and he, he was very upset. And he writes a poem where he imagines a future. This is very characteristic, Shuchenko. Postavlju hatu i kimnatu sadok rajočok na sažu. He's going to have a home of his own, but prisnetsa son meni i te ni ja ne budu spočevate, bo i te prisnetsa i v malej rajočok mi spid teha teha pid kradeša na robež leha zapaleš rajni samotni. That is the memory of this woman writes Shuchenko in this poem, will spoil his days forever. He will never find peace because he loved her. He wanted to marry her. She turned him down. And so whenever, wherever he finds some peace and happiness, he will remember the, the disquiet, the injury she caused him. That too is very characteristic of Shochenko. Nothing for Shochenko ever takes place in a simple world. I'll, I'll skip this poem. This is the other poem which she's mentioned. Shochenko was desperate to get married. That is, this poem late in his life, he is talking about his loneliness. Людей чимало на землі, а доведеться одиноким в холодній хаті в кривобохі, або під тином простягтись, або ні, треба одружитись, хіба б на чортові сестрі, бо доведуть одуріть в самотині. Шевченко felt the need for a quiet home life. It, late in his years, he actually saw it. But by then, he had some strange ideas about what constituted marital bliss. And also, as you can see from the two women he proposed to, this one actually accepted, but then declined. He was looking for a woman that could not possibly exist. He was looking for a woman who would have his understanding of the world as well as his social character. But Shuchenko is a former serf who is rubbing elbows with the most cultured and the most intelligent people in the empire. There is no woman from the serf class that, that can meet that. And Shuchenko was told this by many of his friends. Nevertheless, he wanted to find 
a, a woman of that kind. There's another woman whom we need to mention, who comes up in Shochenko's poetry, who is a real woman, and that's Oksana Kovalenko. Oksana was a childhood friend of Shuchenko's. She's just a little younger than he is. She's an orphan like he is. And he wrote, in fact, she appears in quite a few poems. And the, there are a few others where we gather that it's obviously about her. Let me read from Mariana Chernecha, Marianne the Nun. This is 1841, before Shuchenko's arrest. Shuchenko is a relatively happy young man. He's been freed. He spent a couple of years in Petersburg at the academy. And he's recalling his childhood. And the poem is dedicated to her, to Oksana. That is, he puts in three dots, but we, we now know that he meant Oksana Kovalenko. Не скажуть хоч на сміх, нехай спочиває тільки його й долі, що рано заснув. Чи правда, Оксано, чужа чорнобрива, і ти не згадаєш того сироту, що в сірій світині бувало щасливий, як побачить диво твою красоту? Кого ти без мови, без слова навчила очима, душею, серцем розмовляти? З ким ти усміхалась, плакала, журилась, кому ти любила Петруща співати? He also mentions her in his very well-known poem, Meni Trinachti Menalo, my 13th year was passing, or I was going on 14, that was a good translation. A dівчина при самій дорожі недалеко коло мене плоскінь вибирала, та й почула, що я плачу, прийшла, привітала, утирала мої сльози і поцілувала. Неначе сонце засіяло, неначе все на світі стало моє. Лани гаї сади, і ми жартуючи погнали чужі ягната до води. This is also from 1847. He's still at the Orsk. Kripos. But one of the most important poems about her is a poem entitled Mifkupochti Kolish Rusle. I won't read the whole thing, but I'll just point out that at the end of this poem, he narrates an episode about Oksana, that Oksana went off with soldiers, then vanished and came back with a bastard son and suffered the fate of a pokritka, that is in Ukrainian, that's what you call an unwed mother, someone society doesn't accept. So he turns Oksana, he describes Oksana as this pokritka. There's just one problem. This isn't true. It didn't happen. That is, and here we come up against one of the major problems in dealing with Shevchenko and women. He creates storylines in his poetry 
that don't necessarily reflect what actually happened in reality. Why does he turn Oksana into a Pokritka when that never happened? Shuchenko left Kirilyuka in 1829. He returned in 1843. By then, Oksana was married. She had two kids, and she had never had any unwed children. Shuchenko made this up. It's a storyline we, of course, know from Shuchenko's very well-known poem entitled Katerina. Katerina is a landmark poem for Shuchenko. And here I turn from poetry about real people to poetry about storylines that Shulchenko conceives for women. This is a poem from 1838. It's given a dedication to Zhukovsky in memory of April 22nd, 1838. Now, anyone who ever works on Shuchenko has to always recognize that date. That's the date that Shuchenko was manumitted. That's the date he got his freedom. So for him, this poem becomes a, an important statement about his freedom. But the poem doesn't tell a story about freedom, quite the opposite. The opening lines of this poem are very, very well known to Ukrainians. Kochajte się czarnobrewi, ta nie z moskalami, bo moskali czuży ludy robią lecho z wami. Moskali lubią żartujące, żartujące kiene, pide w swoją moskowszczynę, a dziewczyna gen. What is difficult for non-Ukrainians to see in this poem, what is difficult in translation, not with soldiers, because the word Moskal means both soldier and Muscovite. And in a very, very programmatic way, Shochenko, in this very early moment of his writing career, ties two things together. He ties together both social and national oppression. That is, the simple word, well, because soldiers are a social class that's dangerous. Social, soldiers are a dangerous social class for young women throughout history. That is, every good mother has told her daughter to stay away from soldiers because you're going to come out of it exactly the way Katerina does. You're going to come out of this pregnant and abandoned, right? But here, there are two things going on. Both the fact that this girl is entertaining the interests of a soldier and the fact that the soldier is Russian, or at least he's going to go back to Russia. Catherine is not particularly a good girl. Не слухала Катерина ні батька, ні неньки, полюбила москалика, не знала серденько, Полюбила молодого в садочок, ходила, поки себе свою долю там занапастила. Шученко makes it very clear that she's doing what she wants to do. She is not following the advice or the social prescriptions that a young woman shouldn't do this kind of thing. But Shuchenko presents it in such a way that we sympathize with her. Why wouldn't we sympathize with her? A young girl in love, why shouldn't a young girl follow her dreams, follow her heart? But the inevitable happens. She's pregnant and abandoned. 
and then comes the, the price to pay. And Shushanko presents a fairly difficult scene to read of her parents tossing her out of the house. This is her mother telling her she's got to leave, but her mother tells her she has to leave by explaining that she, the mother, will be suffering because she won't have her daughter. Kto bez tebe hrišnu dušu pomenate bude? Donju moju, donju moju, moja, deťa moje ljube, ide od nas. She chases her away. Ledve, ledve, poblahoslovela, Boh s toboju, ta jak metkva na dil povalelaš. Obizvavša starej bačko, čoho ždeš neboho, zaredala Katerina, ta buh jomu v nohe, prosti meni mi batečku, šo ja narobela, prosti meni mi holube, mi sokole mili. Nechaj tebe, Boh prošaje, ta dobri ljude. Moliš Bohu, ta ide sobi, meni lekše bude. This is a very difficult scene to read especially for parents. How do you chase your daughter out of the house? Sure, she's made a mistake, but she's willing to concede she made a mistake. She asks for mercy, and her parents don't give her any. Shuchenko, in describing Katerina, the great bulk of this poem, deals with all the suffering this girl will, will endure trying to chase down her, her soldier lover holding her, her bastard child in her hands. And it's a long poem, and there's a great deal of suffering, but this passage in particular is important in understanding what Shochenko is doing, because of course we understand that the soldier is a louse and will not return to Katerina. But what we feel here is the incredible social pressure for propriety. That is, the parents cannot accept what their daughter has done. They are the ones who chase her out of the house. They are hurt by what they need to do, but they do it nevertheless. Shuchenko is always tying, as we see in this poem, the fate of women to questions of social and personal justice. And in this poem, the instrument of injustice is represented not only by the soldier who is careless for the woman who loved him, but also by the parents who enforce a morality, who enforce a social code that leads to her undoing. Another early poem from around this time is entitled Utoplina, the drowned maiden. Here once again, we've got a woman who is free, too free, a woman who doesn't meet social standards, a woman who is sinning. Katerina was a sinner and her parents chased her out. And here we have another woman. Let me read a little. Sered sela vdova žela u novih Ateni, bilo leča karo oka i stanom besoka, u županji, kruhom panji, iz peredu, iz boku i molotani u roku i, a za molodoju, a nato še za vdovoju, kozake ordoju taki hodjać, i za neju kozake hodele poki vdova bez soroma dočku porodela. Porodela, ta i baj duže ljudjam hodovate v čužim seli pokenula. O taka to mate. That's the kind of mom she was. She was having a great time. And when she gave birth to a daughter, well, just put her up. Someone else will take care of her and I'll keep doing what I've been doing before. But then that daughter grows up and she too starts attracting the interests of young men. 
а козаки як хмілю той в'ються круганусі, а надто той рубалинка жравий кучерявий мліє в'яне як зостріє ганусю чорняву. Побачила стара мати, сказилася люта, чи бач погань розхристана, байстря не обуте, ти, все ви, ти вже виросла, дівуєш, хлопцями гуляєш, постривай же ось я тобі, мене зневажаєш? Ні, голубко, і от злості зубами скрегоче, отака то бува мати, теж серце дівоче. This young woman, this loose young woman, when she turns into a mother, turns into an ugly mother. This ugly mother drowns her own daughter, her own bastard, her own illegitimate daughter, because she is behaving the same way her mom did. Because mom is jealous because mom is enforcing that same social code that Katerina's parents were enforcing. What we see in this poem and in the other early poem is a vision of sinful women that Shulchenko understands, I will return to this at the very end, in a very peculiar way, but women are associated with love, with sexuality, with sin, and there is something wrong in that. There is something ugly in that. That is, it's not the love itself that's ugly. It's the consequences that result from it. After his conscription and his release from the military, Shuchanko returns to the civilized world a very different man. He has changed. The angry man from the 1840s has turned into, it's not that he's no longer angry, but he thinks a little bit differently. And his understanding of social evils has changed somewhat. And in 1858, he returns to a subject he had used earlier in a poem entitled The Witch. В святині латані дрожала якась людина на ногах і на руках повиступала от стужі кров, аж з трупом стала, і довгі коси в реп'яках ополи бились в ковтунах. Постояла, а потім сіла коло огню і руки гріла на самім полуні. Ну так, оженився неборак, сама собі вона шептала, і тяжко, страшно усміхалась. Що ж це таке? Все не мара, моя все мати і сестра, моя все відьма, щоб ви знали. He describes a disheveled woman, half crazy, who has joined the party of gypsies who are traveling across the country. And she'll be telling them her story. And that's how we will learn what happened to her. But notice in particular the very end of the passage I read, where Shochenko, as he so often does, but here he makes it explicit, he identifies with the women who are his heroes. It's my mother and my sister, it's my witch. Now, of course, if we've read enough Shochenko, we know that Shochenko often associates and identifies with women, but that's the question that these poems raise. Why does he do that? And I'll try to return to that at the end. She is taken into the manor by the Lord and he abuses her. Як я була молодою і гадки не мала про садочку, по садочку похожала, квітчала, спішала, а він мене і набачив, ірод, і не снило, що я була крепачкою, а то б утопилась, було б легше, 
От набачив, та й бере в покої, і стриже не наче хлопця, і в поход з собою бере мене. У бендери прийшли ми, стояли з москалями на квартирах, а москалі за Дунаєм турка боювали. Тут дав Бог мені близнята, якраз проти Спаса, а він мене і покинув. Не вступив і в хату, на дітей своїх не глянув, Люцифер проклятий. Well, clear enough, another soldier, this time he took the woman with him, shaved her head, passed her off as a young boy, abused her. She had children, twins in this case. And then he abandons her. She returns with her children to her native village just in time for her father's death, to witness her father dying. And they grow up, and then the Lord returns, the master returns. And the master takes the children from her. He sends the boy off as a servant to someone's home and brings the the girl, the daughter, into his own home. And that's what this woman, the witch, is doing when she meets the gypsies. She's looking for her children. She's been traveling the country looking for her children. The gypsies take her in, and eventually they cure her. She's no longer crazy. One of the gypsy women teaches her herbs, and she settles down, lives with the gypsies for a while, and then returns to her village. And eventually so does the master, so does the Lord. And when he dies, she tries to help him. She's become a different woman. А як умер, то за його Богу помолилась. І жила собі святою, дівчат научала, щоб з панами не кохались, людей не цурались. А то Бог нас покарає, а ще гірше люди, люди горді, неправедні, своїм судом судять. Отак вона научала болящих, лічила, а з убогим останньою крихтою ділилась. Люди добрі і розумні, добре її знали, а все-таки покриткою і відьмою звали. The social oppression, the social program of an unwed mother has not changed, but the character of the unwed mother in these late works by Shochenko is very different. She is a good woman. In fact, she is saintly. Now, once we get to that, the poster girl for saintly unwed mothers is, of course, Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. We don't think of things that way, but Shochenko saw this. Shochenko understood that if you want to write, if he wants to write about unwed mothers, Maria, the mother of Jesus Christ, is certainly a good topic for him. The poem begins as a prayer, asking Mary to protect the downtrodden. He describes Mary as a young, beautiful, sensual, good, and thoughtful girl. She worries about the future. Скажи мені моя порада, яка я доля вийде нам старим Іосифом? О доле, і похилилась, мов то поля од вітру хилича в яру. Йому я стану за дитину. Плечми моїми молодими його старі підопру. І кинула кругом очима, аж іскри сипнули з очей, а з добрих молодих плечей хітон полатаний додолу тихесенько сунувся. Ніколи такої божої краси ніхто не узрить. 
злая ж доля колючим тедном провела, знущалася над красотою. A very sensual image of Mary. And then along comes the young man. Shuchanko doesn't call him the Archangel Gabriel. He's just a young man who tells Joseph and Mary the news, the news about John the Evangelist and the coming Messiah. And the evening ends with a quiet scene. Horic, ohoin tekenko na kabeci, a Jose pravedne sedeć ta dumaje. Uže zirneća na nebi jasno zanjalaš. Maria vstala ta i pišla z lekom po vodu do kreneći i host sa neju i v jaročku dohnal Mariju. Da, da, da. That is, Dohnal Mariu, and what happened? That is, is he just another instance of a young man, a young Moskal, a young soldier who's taking advantage of the young woman? Very next words in the poem talk about came morning. Then comes the crucial salvation from unwed motherhood. Ti bestalanaya, choho ish desh ish datemesh od Boha i od ljudej joho, ničoho, niže apostola toho teper nežde, te slaru Bohi tebe povinčanu vede svoju ubohuju hatinu, moleša i djakuj što ne kenu, što na rozputja ne prognao. A to pce hlinu ju ubili, jak by ne vkriv, ne zachoval. Joseph is presented as a righteous man who saves the unwed mother from disaster. She would be stoned if not for him. He has to take her as a wife because she is with child. All of this is very different from any of the plot lines earlier. But the real key comes at the end of the poem. Mary, of course, spends the, this is a long poem, and Mary spends the bulk of the poem enduring the difficulties of motherhood, the difficulties of a boisterous child. There's even a scene in the poem where John the Baptist and Christ are playing, and since Christ's father is a carpenter, the, the little kid tries to make something out of the wood pieces he has, and he makes a cross. And Mary knows his future. And so she rips it out of his hands in anger and says, don't play with that. Right? But the poem ends with, of course, the crucifixion of Christ and the aftermath. Rozpialash tvoja jedina ja detena. And I'll call your attention to that. The translation, of course, can't show this. is not the same thing as for you detenu rozpiale. Rozpialash tvoja detena. A te spočenuše pitenum u Nazareto toj pišla. Vdovu davno vže pochovale v čuži pozečeni truni i čuži i ljude. A Ivana ji zarizali v čurmi. I Josefa tvojho ne stalo, i te jak palič to je ostalač, odna od nisinka, taki talan tvi latani neboho, prati joho učenike, ne tvrdi dušo bohi, ka tam na muku ne daleš, schovališ, potim rozišliš, i te jih musela zberate, otož vone jakož zišli v noči kruh tebe sumovate, i te velika je v ženah, i jih unenije i strah rozvijala, mol tu polovu, svojim svjatim ohnennem slovom te duh svjatej svi pronesla v jih duši Bohi. Hvala i pohvala tobi, Marije, muživo spradnule svjateje, po všomu svitu rozišleš, 
і іменем Твого Сина, Твоєї скорбної дитини, любов і правду рознесли по всьому світі. Ти ж під тином, сумуючи у бур'яні, умерла з голоду. Амінь. Well, once again, Shuchenko is playing with the facts. Of course, Mary didn't die popitinu. That's the fate of unwed mothers, but it's not the real fate, it's not the biblical fate of Mary. But what is so crucial in this poem is that Shuchenko in his later incarnations of women, of unmarried women, that typical image of his, sees them as saintly, sees them as good people. They are still downtrodden by society. They are still not given their due. Even their children abuse them, as does Christ by dying in front of his mother on the cross. But they are now good people. They don't commit suicide the way Katerina does. They don't kill their daughters the way Utoplina does. And here, what I want to say about Shuchenko and women comes to a head. That is, it's not a hard and fast case. But Shuchenko, as I keep emphasizing, we always need to pay attention to when he's writing the works we're reading. The early Shuchenko identifies with women for a very peculiar reason. The unwed mother, the suffering, sinful woman, is an image that Shuchenko sees himself in. Shuchenko was a happy child, or so he says in his poetry, until he got manumitted and met the people who are the people who cause injustice in the world. Shuchenko in the 1840s, visiting the homes of all those rich people that we talked about early in the talk tonight, sees what social evil looks like. He sees the injustice in society. He sees the class injustice in society. But what's more, what he sees is that he's become part of it. That is, by choosing a good life, by choosing the life of a poet, of a painter, of a free person, he has become part of this and is being punished by it because his suffering is the suffering of someone who sees injustice. That's what we see in the early poetry. He, like the Pokritke, like the suicidal Katerina, cannot bear to endure the conditions that they have been put in. After his conscription and return from his sentence, Shuchenko sees goodness in a different way. That is, and mostly he sees goodness in himself. And so his image of the Pokritka, his image of the sinful woman, he is still associating with the sinful woman. But he now sees that the sinful women are saints, and he allows himself a little more latitude in his view of himself. He no longer chastises himself the way he used to. Just as these women endure and do good while enduring, so he as a poet sees himself as a messianic figure whose endurance, whose suffering, whose poetry eventually must do society and his people some good. I've been talking too long. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor, for this interesting informative and very deep talk. I believe we all learn a great deal about women's, women in the Taras Shevchenko's works. Thank you for reciting Shevchenko poetry in Ukrainian. It was a great pleasure to listen and deeply feel it. Um, now, 
Um, I would like to invite um, our um, participants to ask any questions in Q&A. There are some comments, very interesting presentation. Um, there is a question, will this presentation be online? Yes, it will. Uh, now we are recording this presentation and uh, maybe tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, we will post it, um, post it online. Um, you are very welcome to visit our Shevchenko Museum Facebook page the link will be there. It's um, facebook.com slash Shevchenko Museum. Um, there is a comment from Oksana Piotrzewski. Uh, such an excellent presentation. I learned a new depth of Shevchenko. Um, very good. Then uh, there is a comment from Valeri. Thank you very much, Dr. Ternavsky. Very powerful and thoughtful presentation. Um, in the meantime, while we're still receiving the, the questions, I want to ask my own question. Um, the um, friends of Shevchenko, um, uh, in in their in their diaries in their letters, they all refer to Shevchenko as a cheerful, um, very talkative, um, happy man. And uh, in his poetry, most of his poetry is about um, is about injustice, about um, um, all kinds of punishment, suffering. Um, and uh, I know that there is a tendency in the literature, in rom romantic, rom romantic literature, uh, to talk about that, to write poetry about that. But what actually was behind that, that poetry, which is always sad and very, sometimes very dark? Thank you for that question. That's a very good question. And it's, you know, it, it, it's hard in a brief talk like this to explain how, how Shochenko can be understood both as a human being and as a poet. In many ways, I am indebted here to the work of George Grabovich, who perhaps the most important work in uncovering how to read Shochenko both as a human being and as a poet comes from him, although they, others have worked on this too, but he makes this the hallmark of his approach to Hrabovich. Hrabovich the poet is a projection. Hrabovich, the, I'm sorry, Shuchenko the poet is a projection. That is, it, it's always important not to confuse the real person and the author, particularly when the author is writing poetry that sounds like it's about him, right? We, we know this from literature over history, but among romantic poets, this is most problematical. There were romantic poets who projected themselves more or less as real people. That is, Lord Gordon George Byron is often seen as precisely what he projected himself to be. Shochenko was not. That is, Shochenko, as you know, there's a famous incident when Shochenko returns from, from his uh, incarceration to uh, Petersburg and Moscow. And, you know, he is a man about town. He is lionized. Various people see him as an important uh, person, as a, you know, cultured person, a poet and an artist. And when Kulish asks him to write a blurb about himself, just a couple sentences biographically, Shuchenko botches the job very badly, doesn't mention that he writes poetry, right? Because his complexes are catching up with him. That is, Shuchenko isn't sure at some points when he is to project himself and when he is to be himself. 
one of the things we know about Shuchenko is that this, this happy-go-lucky Shuchenko is a little bit of a myth. That is, Shuchenko deeply resented the world he lived in. That is, we cannot forget the fact that this is a former serf. That is, serfdom in the Russian Empire was just like slavery in, in the United States. This was a horrid social institution. And the serfs in Russia were essentially not people. That is, owners could do various things with them. Now, not all owners were horrible and some serfs could live a reasonably decent life, but the whole social institution allowed for an abuse of these human beings in horrible ways. And I, the example, when I, when I talk to students about this, I always say, you know, these serfs are effectively cows. Right? And so when Shuchenko gets manumitted, when Shuchenko's freedom is bought, Shuchenko moves in the universe of beings from a cow to a human being. But he cannot forget the fact that he was a cow. And so when he goes to the home of Zakrevsky or Tarnovsky, and he witnesses the behavior of masters towards their serfs, he's horrified. There are famous incidents where Shurchenko arrived at some rich estate where he's been invited. That is, he's the guest of honor. And he goes around to the back entrance where the serf's going, right? Because he feels comfortable doing that. For him, those are my people. Now, of course, he does some of this just to insult the masters because he sees that they're abusing the serfs, right? So Shurchenko is at various times a very happy man. He has very reason, every reason to be happy. That is, when Shochenko's freedom was bought and he lived the life of a young art student in Petersburg, when after that he travels to Ukraine and he's a budding young artist and all kinds of wonderful people are inviting him to their homes, why shouldn't he be happy? It's a life that was unimaginable to him 20 years earlier. It was a life unimaginable to him seven years earlier. But he still has these complexes. And those complexes, those psychological roots of unhappiness, which are the preeminent cause is injustice. But he also has a, very, a variety of his own peculiarities as a human being. That is, he, he doesn't always see things very clearly. So the, you know, between the poetry and the human being, the first thing to remember is the poetry is a projection. This is not the real Taras. It's what he's trying to tell us, right? And so the real Taras may be doing various things. He can be sitting around with Viktor Zakrowski and getting absolutely drunk and telling crazy stories and having a good time and then get up the next day and write poetry about social injustice. That is, he's a complex human being and both sides of him exist. Thank you very much. Interesting. Uh, it's interesting to say that, uh, as you have mentioned, he lived the life in St. Petersburg as a free man. The artist, he lived the life of, uh, of uh, privileged people. And uh, here you go. He comes home and paints Katerina. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, there is a question from Wilfred Szczesny. Uh, how was Shevchenko's drive to get married reflected in his poetry of that time? Well, that is, he has that poem where he says quite clearly, you know, I, I married a devil's sister. I don't need to get married, right? And, and the poems about Likera, the disappointment. That is, a lot of what Shulchenko does, that is, in his late poetry, when Shulchenko, Shulchenko very often vacillates between images of social injustice and images of ideal happiness. Sadok Vishnevi Kolokha, right? That, that actually is an image that he then undercuts, right? He says, ah, that's all nonsense, no such thing exists. But he likes to depict the, the notion of a quiet, comfortable life for himself. Certainly after his return from military conscription, he depicts a life, he's always, you know, right? He wants a home. He wants to live in peace and quiet. 
How real that is, I don't know. That, that too is a projection. That is, we, we know biographically that he actually laid out plans. That is, he, he's an artist. He, he drew homes for himself, right? That is, he planned this. What, what was in Shochenko's mind for real? That we'll never know. That is, you know, if, if, if he had known Dr. Freud and lay down on the couch and told him a few things, maybe we'd know a little bit more about Shochenko. But all we have are the documents. And half of the documents, the, the poetry, are deliberate projections of himself. That is, it's not the truth. It's not the truth in the sense that a psychiatrist is looking for some kind of deep understanding. Right. Um, Albert Krivold, uh, wonderfully presented. Do you see the women in his poetry as embodying the soul of Ukraine? Of course they do, but that is, it's not that simple. That is, Shevchenko doesn't have a nationalist idea of Ukraine. That is, he's not building a country, he's building a just society. And so Ukraine, in the sense that, you know, in the middle of the 20th century, there's some notion of a state and the, the will of the people is determining. Shushenko doesn't think about things like that. They, they, are, they are not part of his consciousness. So, you know, are women the embodiment of Ukraine? In a sense, of course they are. That's such a traditional image that it's inescapable. But in what sense are they? That is, they are to an enormous degree, an embodiment of the social injustice that is Ukrainian society, right? And in that sense, absolutely, that, you know, that, that's for real, right? But this notion that, you know, he sees every, you know, not every woman, but, you know, certainly doesn't see the Tsarecha as an embodiment of Ukraine. That is, but that women represent some kind of idealized version of Ukraine. Yes and no, that it, you know, I mean, we just saw the, the poem to Tarnovska, where it essentially, you know, he's a guy in a bar saying, oh, come on, babe, you know, go out with me, right? Well, <laughs> obviously, that's not an embodiment of Ukraine in some sense. That is, you know, he's just talking to a woman like, like a barroom, you know, rape. <laughs> right. There is a question from Taras Koznarski. Have you had a chance to look into depiction of women in Shevchenko's prose? How do they compare to women in his poetry? They're different. <laughs> they, you know, I have not made a study of that. That is, that is as, as I said at the very beginning, I am interested in the poetry. I am much less interested in the real Shuchenko. I am much less interested in his prose. But yes, that is his prose. There are all kinds of other things going on in his prose. And there, he, he depicts women in, in, you know, in social injustice situations somewhat differently in his prose than he does in his poetry. But, you know, I, I will step back from that question, if I may, because it's not something I feel that I have any expertise in. True, thanks. Um, it, from uh, Daria Darevich, the question, is the presentation of women by Shevchenko unique in Ukrainian literature? Uh, it's easy. The easy answer is Shuchenko is completely unique in Ukrainian literature. There is no such thing in Ukrainian literature as Taras Shuchenko number two. Right? There is also really no other romantic poet in Ukrainian literature who has the kind of projection that uh, uh, Shuchenko has. That is. You know, even a poet like Kulish, an interesting, a good poet, he writes in a different mode. That is, he, he is not that kind of a romantic poet projecting his own psyche. I think every poet projects his own psyche, but Kulish is not creating the image of a Kobzar the way Shuchenko is doing that all his life. Shuchenko understood this from the very beginning and from beginning to end, he is writing poetry to represent himself in public. He understands that he has that kind of a role. Now, who else in Ukrainian literature? I mean, the most interesting depictions of women in 19th century Ukrainian literature come from Markovo Chok. You know, Mar Markovo Chok, you know, a woman writing under a male pseudonym, writes abolitionist stories in which men are superfluous. 
That is, you know, if you if we watch Hollywood movies and women appear on the screen for either sex or for you know to to in, engage the plot in some kind of romantic direction, that's what Markovo Truck does with men. You know, her stories are wonderful because a man appears in the story for the explicit purpose of giving birth to a child so that the woman who is at the actual center of the story can care for the child. And more often than not in Markovo Truck stories, the man then disappears, right? just completely. He's out of the story, right? That kind of version of women. Now, Markovo Truck is doing nothing similar to Shulchenko, right? But she... Her women are interesting. Her women represent, the, there's a strength of w women's thinking. There's a strength of women's characters in Markovo truck that I, I really can't place anywhere else in, in you know, mid 19th century Ukrainian literature. Not, not until we get much later. And not until we get to someone like Kobylanska or, or, or even Koprenska. Thank you. Pani Daria just pointed out that uh, the question was from Yuri Darevich. Not from her. <laughs> the next question is from Christine Mac McNeil. Uh, to what do you attribute the change in, um, in attitude to women after his exile? His paintings during uh, this time show how observant he is to his surroundings. To me, this shows a very sensitive personality. Did he indeed be, uh, become more attuned to people? It, it, I think Shevchenko was well attuned to people even before his exile. That is, what, what exile changes, that is one of, one of the readings that I want to promote of Shevchenko is that Shuchenko is peculiarly focused on his own guilt. How can I live the life of a high society, Petersburg, bon vivant, in a world that is as unjust as this, right? I, th that's what poems like Dume Moi, Dume Moi, Leko Menizvame are all about. That is, you know, grab your head and, and scream because you are not only living in an unjust world, you embody the injustice of this world. And how can you deal with yourself, right? That's what changes after exile. That is, after exile, Shuchenko is not kicking himself as much as he used to. That is, the, the earlier Shuchenko is so angry, but he's angry not just at the world, he's angry at himself, right? The, the Shuchenko that returns from exile has matured in some way. That is, he gives himself a break. That is, the, the poem, I talked about one, Vigma. We, we look at poems that he reworked, a poem that he wrote just before exile. That is, it's, it's the Kosarao expedition that makes a difference. It's when he goes to Petropolos, right? Because up to that point, he's writing. He's not allowed to, but he is. So between Vidma 1 and Vidma 2, between Moskaleva Krenecha 1 and Moskaleva Krenecha 2, what we discover is Shuchenko has changed his moral code. That is, he is, he is more forgiving. He understands goodness in the world in a way that he didn't really talk about it before. Right? That is, I, you know, I, when we look at something like Haidamake, I don't think the late Shuchenko could have written Haidamake. That is, I, I, it, it, it's, a, it's a different kind of world, right? As for the comparison of his artwork and his poetry, once again, his artwork is seldom a projection of him. That is, he, uh, you know, I, I, I have looked at the question of his self-representation, that is, his, his autoportraits, right? And the, there, you know, some of that is interesting, but in his portraits, that is a lot of the portraits, you know, Two things. Shushchenko is not the painter that he is a poet. That is, Shushchenko is a decent painter, but uh, no, this is not an earth shattering, world changing painter. Right? And a lot of what he does, and a lot of what he does well, are portraits. That is, portraiture, of course, is bread and butter for an artist. That is, you know, that, that in 43, when he goes to Ukraine, before he graduates in 45, well, that's what artists do. They, they paint portraits. You make money this way. That is, he painted the whole Tarnovsky family, he painted all the Zakrevskys, right? That is, 
uh, people want their, you know, a rich landlord wants his wife painted, he wants his children painted, right? That's normal. And so Shochenko was quite good at that. You know, I mean, the other thing he was good at is lithography, but you know, he was a decent portraitist. And when he is sketching the, the Cossacks, right? When he's sketching, for example, the, the Petropavlovsk fort commander's wife, he has very nice images of these people. But then it, you could just imagine what it means for Shuchenko to be in the resident of the residence of the fort commander, to talk to intelligent cultured people in a world where you know the closest intelligent cultured people other than these is 500 kilometers away, right? That is, he's a soldier, a conscripted soldier in the barracks with people he hates, with, with malicious people. And so when, he, when he's in that setting and painting a portrait of the, the commander's wife, that is, is, is there anything about this that is him or is he just enjoying himself because it, life is less bad here than it would be back in the fort in the barracks? Thank you. The next question is uh, from Ol Olga uh, Hometa. Thank you for your very insightful presentation. I have learned a lot tonight. My question is about the evil in Shevchenko's works that you focused on tonight. My understanding is that already in his early poetry, the evil evil. The evil is the society that rejects the unwed pregnant um, woman and the men soldiers and landowners who appear as abusers for their taking advantage of the heroine and uh, ultimately for their ab abandoning her, for the, for the abandoning her and her child. Um, it is less the sinful heroine uh, who plays a role of the evil. Uh, it is implied in his early works and became emphasized in Maria, for instance. Do you think this is the case with the evil in Shevchenko? Well, I, I would be cautious not to not to jump past something that is in Katerina, the parents throw their daughter out. Had they not thrown their daughter out, she wouldn't have suffered all the suffering she goes through for the rest of the poem. That is the, the scene, that's why I read that scene because I think it is absolutely vital for us to understand that, you know, Shuchenko, of course, the Moskai is evil, right? He rejects not only Katerina, he rejects his son. He, he's just a jerk. <laughs> but the parents are also part of this equation. And to me, it's very important that the symbol for social injustice becomes an unwed mother because an unwed mother is not innocent, not in Shuchenko's understanding. Shuchenko is not a moralist. He's not going to go chase down unwed mothers and say, you bad girl. Right? But fundamentally, you have transgressed. You have done something wrong. Right? How wrong is it? Well, it's mildly wrong. It's a mistake. <laughs> that is, you know, Shuchenko isn't going to explicate sin in some major way. He'll talk about sin when he talks about Tarbovska. He'll talk about sin jokingly, but not here, right? But it, the women are not innocent because in my understanding of what's going on, Shuchenko feels guilty about himself and he has done the same guilty thing that these unwed mothers did. That is, he has accepted something he shouldn't accept. He has accepted the high life. He has accepted the good life. He has transgressed against his social class, against the social rules that say, you're this, not that. Those social rules may be wrong, just as the rules governing social behavior towards an unwed mother may be wrong, but they still, they, they create the universe in which he lives, right? And so, you know, where does evil come from? 
that's a religious question that Shuchenko isn't going to answer. That is, Shuchenko will always talk about evil in the world as already there. It is there because people do things for various reasons. Some of the evil in the world, like the parents throwing Katerina out of their house, isn't malicious evil at all. That is, it's just the way things are. Thank you. There is someone who wants to touch with you, so I will send the this um, particular um, uh, this particular address and name to you. And uh, other questions. Two questions came from Terry. Is it possible to understand psychological aspects of his life um, across after such time and cultural difference? For example, 19th century Eastern Slavic to 21st century Western Anglo-American life. It's, I won't say it's impossible because if it were impossible, people like me should stop doing what we do for a living. <laughs> that is, if, if it's completely impossible to understand writing in the 19th century, I better give up on the tree Levitsky, I better give up on Shuchenko and all kinds of other people. But is it difficult? Yes, it is extremely difficult. And that is, we who try to understand uh, a man like Shochenko in the 19th century need to be extremely careful. We need to be extremely careful not to apply our own understanding of the world to him. He doesn't necessarily have that kind of an understanding of the world. Shochenko will very definitely see the world differently. But at the same time, you know, that is, let, let's move this question from Shochenko to Shakespeare, right? Shakespeare is even further in the past. And could we even remotely understand what Shakespeare's psychology is like? Well, in fact, most Shakespeare students think they do. That is, Shakespeare is so explicit in so many things that we, we can have a decent sense and in that way, Shakespeare is extremely modern. That is, few readers find Shakespeare completely incomprehensible in a psychological sense. I think the same thing is going to turn out to be true with Shochenko. That is, we don't understand Shochenko for a great variety of reasons. One, as you suggest, is just the, the enormous wall of time between us where things have changed and we can't go back and undo what we know about the modern world. The other big obstacle with Shochenko is that he hides himself. That is, like I say, his poetry is a projection. And half the problem in Shochenko studies is that people read his poetry verbatim, right? You know, that is for the longest time, very serious people, half the biographies of Shochenko that exist say that you know, Oksana Kovalenko had a, a bastard son and returned to the village. Well, it's just not true. That is, when, when you actually sit down, and people have done this, they sit down in the Kiriliuka metric books and see who was born and who wasn't born, you know, who, who she married, when she married, were there bastard children. I mean, bastard children are recorded. That is, the scholars who've done this, that is, I, I remember the one that I was reading said, in the year 1843, in only the one village of Kiriliuka, there were 17 bastard children born, right? But we know, <laughs> it's not a mystery. That is, we can, we, if you sit down and figure it out, you'll get it, right? And so if you read Shuchenko verbatim, then, you know, Oksana Kovalenko was his one and true love. He loved her absolutely. And, you know, she, she sinned and had, had unwed children, you know? But in reality, she didn't. Right? And so our, our reading of Shochenko as a human being, that is understanding his psychology, needs to have a whole lot of facts, including things like, that's not true. He's saying that, but it's not true. Yes. Uh, the other question is, was Shevchenko gay? Um, even he wanted to be married. It, I have no idea because I never met him. And so I have no possibility of judging whether you know, human sexuality is such a complicated thing that who knows that is, you know, all kinds of people have all kinds of sexual inclinations. 
was Shuchenko interested in women? You bet. <laughs> he, he was interested in women. <laughs> he tried to get married. That is, all the, all these women that he, he you know, it, it talks about that is in, in biographical materials, you know, that is, he really did like them. That is, from what other people say about him, that is, you know, he flirted with women. W women liked him because he gave all the outward appearance of being a man who likes women. Right? You know, I, I, the return from his exile in Nizhny Novgorod, right? There's that wonderful episode. Once again, it's a guilt thing because, you know, his friend is showing up in town and he's going to miss him because he went to the bordello. That is, he went to a brothel, spent the night in the brothel, got his wallet stolen and missed his friend in town because he was doing this. Right. Well, you know, yeah, he went he went to the brothels. There is one comment uh, from the anonymous attendee. Uh, he certainly is <clears throat> projecting to what is happening in Ukraine on this very day. <clears throat> there is, <clears throat> there I, is if another. I, if I could comment on that, I'm not sure Shuchenko, you know, helps us understand what's going on today. But I do want to call out uh, to everyone's attention that the Shuchenko Prize the big Ukrainian culture prize was announced today. And my colleague, Oksana Lutsishna, won the Shuchenko Prize in Literature for, I have it right here, for Ivani Feba. Congratulations. Congratulations to Oksana. Yeah, I, don't, I, I doubt she's on our, our webinar, but I, I wanna, that's what happened today in Ukraine that's tied to Shuchenko. <laughs> Pass our congratulations to her. Uh, now the question is from Taras Martin. Um, in Shevchenko's fate, does he come to terms with himself uh, because he accepts himself? Uh, it's the way things are? If, if you mean the poem, that is, it, it's a threesome of poems. Poem, yes, poem is in quotes. Yeah, the, that is, the, you know, Slava Vola, that is fate, uh, fame, and oh, I forget what the Musa. Dola Musa Slava. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a triptych of poems that needs to be read together. That is, those poems, they're almost circular. That is, Shochenko starts talking about fame, for example. He presents her fame as a barroom girl, right? And yeah, okay, honey, I'm with you. I want the fame, right? But then turns it around and, you know, it, that turns out to be scandalous, right? He does the same thing. Those poems are actually explorations of his attitude to those three pillars. And I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that there are clear indications that, that he has come to terms. That is, but he's certainly thinking about this. That is, what I find remarkable about those three poems is the fact that he is willing to project that image of himself. That is, you know, so much of the earlier images of Shuchenko, the Dume Moi, the Kobzar images, are in a different vein. Here he is projecting himself as a successful poet. As, a, as, as someone who is way past this idea of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, a suffering poet in, in the garrets of Petersburg and oh me, oh, my life is terrible, right? He is exploring the idea, what right do I have as a human being to be a famous poet? Isn't it wonderful or interesting that uh, all these three poems, Dolia, Moza and Slava, Shevchenko talks talks about these three things uh, as he would talk about women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they, he uses that. Well, because they're all temptations. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It, that it, it, it's, you know, it, it's the kind of imagery I, you know, I don't, I don't want to get too, you know, uh, obscene about this, but it's, it's brothel imagery <laughs> that he's, you know, that is the temptation of fate, the temptation of, you know, the muse and so on. Right. Um, from Thomas Primak, 
Uh, interesting talk. Could you please speak a bit about Shevchenko's attitude towards Maxim Maximovich and especially his wife, whom he seemed to be? I deliberately chose to uh, talk only about I just about don't know this word and 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 I'm more of and I I can't say I, I have any you know that is. I, I am not the Shuchenko expert, you know, you're, you're taking me to me. I, I have not looked up, you know, Mrs. Maximovich and, and what Shuchenko thought of them. There is, you know, they're not in the poetry. It's interesting to, to, uh, to say that um, when Shevchenko eagerly wanted to get married after exile, of course, and uh, he wrote to his friends and relatives, please find me a girl. And, uh, and he mentioned, please, please find me someone who is like Maria Maximovich. Uh -huh. he, he liked her a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, looks like uh, our webinar is uh, coming to an end. I would like to thank you very much, Professor Tarnowski, for this very interesting, very inspiring presentation. It is a great tribute to the genius of Shevchenko, especially on his uh, 207th anniversary of his birth. Um, I would like to thank our technical support person, Zoria Murphy, uh, for making um, sure everything goes smooth and nice. The webinar is being recorded and um, uh, very soon it will be posted online. And uh, I thank our participants, our audience for being with us this evening. And uh, I hope that that past two hours were the most delightful part of your day. Thank you very much. And I hope that uh, you join us for future Shevchenko talks. And I thank you all as well. And especially you, Yudmila for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>